All right, everybody, welcome. Jeff Morris here, president and co-founder of the Dream Smart Academy. We are in the Leading in Crisis Behavior, It's a Family Affair uh, webinar today. And with us, we have Kenyatta Turner, who is Dream Smart Academy's Behavior Superpower Diva. And we also have uh, Dr. Greg Spencer, long-term, long-time friend and Dream Smart Academy um, advisory board member. Kenyatta, Greg, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Before we get started, we want to have um, just a real quick moment of thanks to uh, say thank you to Anissa Aven of Turnkey Coaching Solutions for having us on for like a, a third or fourth time. Some member of our team has been on. Kenyatta, you've been on a couple times, a couple times, uh, myself as well. So we want to thank Sheila, who's on the on the call. She's a rock star. We want to thank Paige, who's a rock star. And we want to thank Turnkey for all that they're, they're doing to provide these uh, valuable HR strategies for navigating uh, crisis and change. And with that, Kenyatta, won't you briefly uh, introduce yourself, and then Dr. Greg, to the audience, you'll introduce yourself, and then we'll get started with our, our webinar today. Absolutely. Hey, everybody. My name is Kenyatta, and uh, Jeff likes to call me the behavioral superpower diva, and I'll go with that. That's cool. <laughs> I'm also uh, the founder of Free, uh, Freedom Empire Consulting, but I do a lot of the behavioral superpowers consulting for Dream Smart Academy. I absolutely love this information and love helping people um, understand themselves through self awareness, through understanding their behavioral superpowers, and then helping them unleash their powers upon the world. So excited to be here and talk to you guys about how this can affect your family both at work and at home. Dr. Greg? I'm Dr. Greg Spencer. I'm a vice president of a um, social justice bilingual education organization uh, and what's interesting about that background is that I see the impact when homes are not behaviorally smart and when we are not engaging with our children effectively and then secondly uh, the stressors that we all are feeling not only during this pandemic time, but just in general, uh, really impact our behavior. So I look forward to our conversation today. Dr. Gray, thanks. That's awesome. Well, one of the reasons we have you on the call is just to um, provide some, some actionable strategies a little, little bit later on. You'll be talking about some of the stressors of COVID-19. We'll also be talking about uh, how you can manage this new world that we're in. Um, not just for COVID-19, but beyond COVID-19 as well. So Kenyatta, um, next next slide, please. Again, we've already talked about uh, the, the Leading in Crisis seminar that Turnkey has been putting on since the beginning of April. They've had over 60 speakers. They're providing phenomenal uh, insights and resources to HR professionals, uh, business owners, and business leaders from around the world at this point. A little, about, a little bit about me. I, I've been on here before, so I won't do a whole lot of talking. The Dream Smart Academy, we do um, a couple things really well, or we exist for a couple different reasons. Uh, we decode human behavior, uh, we optimize performance in seven key areas, and we enhance overall well being. We do that through a process of coaching, training, uh, mentoring, or just our educational process. And why do we do it? because after many years of just dealing with individuals, families, and businesses, we understand that um, people like to live life on purpose. They wanna wake up out of the bed every single morning with intention and passionate about what it is they wanna become or what they wanna do. And more importantly, they wanna live in an in a authentic life. And that's something that Dream Smart Academy is dedicated to doing and committed to doing as well. And my background is in the area of uh, traumatology and crisis management. I work with a lot of uh, organizations, first responders and others that are frankly dealing with acute crises, whether that's uh, school shootings, uh, whether that is catastrophes, or how do we just deal with a 2 a.m. call because something has happened in the home environment. So that's my passion and background. And then be able to, to melt that background with uh, my uh, background as a superintendent, school principal, working with families and children for many decades now and seeing the, the issues that come up if we don't manage behavior effectively. So once again, uh, the opportunity to come and share with you today is, uh, is uh, my appreciation to you. Thank you. 
and uh, myself, that's a little bit more about my background. I spent the last 25 plus years working in colleges. Um, I ran organizations, every single department I've probably been the director of. And so I saw a cycle of not only helping students come into the college system and go through the college system and maybe graduate, actually only about 45% of people graduate um, from college nationwide, but a lot of people didn't make it. But the ones who did, I was there from them as well at every phase of that situation. But the one thing I saw in running departments, helping students pick a school, go to a school, um, is the cycle of how important it would have been and how amazing it would have been if I had access to the tools that I have now through Dream Smart Academy with the behavioral superpowers. That's really what I saw as a vision of if more people had access to this information, how much better would I have been able to do my job and helping people pick a school, stay focused while they were there, accomplish what they wanted to do, be productive at home or in school or even on the job. And so a lot of what I do really comes from the excitement of being able to share this information with people now that I know about it. Well, as, as you can see, audience, um, we have to constantly tell Kenyatta to pick up her energy level. She just doesn't bring too much. <laughs> <laughs> she brings too little energy in, in every conversation. So bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> We want to have a little fun today. Uh, we all know that we're under a tremendous amount of stress, both at home and in, in, in the workplace uh, because of our uh, COVID-19 crisis. So we don't want to continue to have the, the talks that many have had before. So we want to have a little different spin on what we want to do today. And that's on the topic of behavior. It's a family affair. If you would, you all remember the show, um, it's a family affair. There was a show in like the, the late seventies, early eighties, somewhere around there. It's a family affair. Is that what it was called? Yeah. <laughs> family affair. Family affair. There we go. <laughs> family affair. If anyone else out there uh, is listening, would you type yes if you remember um, family affair? Number one, that's going to tell us how old you are. So probably if you say no, you're probably under the age of forty. <laughs> so if you remember family affair, type yes. We got a couple of yeses already coming in. Uh, what a great show. What a, what a different time. And someone said, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm older than that. <laughs> <laughs> so today's takeaways, we, want, we have a couple. Um, navigating the new stressors in the COVID world of 19. After just talking uh, to business leaders and owners from around the world, we understand that um, we're in a new stressful environment. We want to talk about some of those things, talk about how we navigate those things. We want to talk about three universal needs and a foundational truth um, for all people. After more than 10 years of studying with Dr. Greg and, and Kenyatta, we understand um, the topic of behavior very well, right? We understand how families, how individuals show up, especially in times of stress or crisis, uh, but more importantly, we understand how people show up when they're extremely euphoric too. So we're gonna talk about some foundational truths. We're gonna talk about the workplace family and the home environment this new hybrid environment that we find ourselves in. And no matter which environment we have to work in every day, both home and at work, we still have a need to be productive in, in both. Talk about re reducing relational friction. Kenyatta is going to be our expert today on the platinum triangle of patient communication and avoidable barriers. She's going to touch on that briefly. If you haven't seen her topic on what I just mentioned, you got to go see it in the replay on the YouTube channel um, from Turnkey. And then Dr. Greg is gonna have the last word. We call it Dr. Greg Says. Um, <laughs> these are gonna be actionable strategies strategies to manage uh, the new normal. Anything to add to that, Dr. Greg or Kenyatta? We're good. Nope, we're already on the next slide. <laughs> awesome. Kenyatta, you're that fast paced and this you know, influencer that wanna get things you know, popping real quick. I've got the, I've got the clicker. <laughs> <laughs> right? So behavioral superpower, foundational truths. As I said earlier, um, the Dream Smart Academy has been studying behavior uh, for more than 10 years. And initially we started out in studying financial literacy and wellness and really quickly got into the role that emotions and behavior play in how we manage our finances and quickly evolved into what we are today. And that's a behavioral science firm that's really dedicated to, as I said before, decoding human behavior, uh, optimizing performance, and then in increasing overall our well-being. And this is a foundational truth that we've come to, to, to realize. Behavior, behavior and social emotional intelligence drive 93% of all life, relationship, 
and financial choices. And after collaborating with many organizations around the area of uh, behavior, this is a foundational truth for all people, regardless of age, wealth, culture, position, or situation. And the current crisis that we find ourselves in, this is definitely um, something that we understand very well. Our behavior and our social emotional intelligence are two of the most critical life skills needed, uh, especially in today's environment because it drives so much of what we do. The role of emotion is uh, critical to understand. And Kenyatta, Dr. Greg, would you like to share a thought or two here about this foundational truth? Uh, go ahead, Kenyatta. Well, I, I think that um, I love how it says, you know, right here, we know that all people, regardless of age and wealth and, and all of that, because if, oh, I didn't even click that, but it went to the next slide. <laughs> it was so fast. But ultimately, you know, it comes down to that if, if more than, you know, two people are involved, there's communication happening. And then your behavior is going to dictate how that relationship is going to play out, regardless of who's involved or the nature of the relationship. So that is absolutely true for everyone, because without, um, without the awareness, sometimes it's just a guessing game, right? Mm -hmm. And with the awareness, then you really can make actionable decisions if you truly understand your own behavior. And then how you show up in the world is really going to matter once you have an understanding of that. So it's true for all of us. And I think what people are realizing now that we're sequestered is that we were not meant as human beings to be locked up with our same DNA for too long in a consistent way. So it's interesting to see the dynamics of how family engagements taking place, communication or the lack thereof, the mm -hmm. stressors that we're fa uh, facing right now. And so one of the things that we're really excited about this conversation is how do we frame that? Because we have pre-COVID and now we have current and that we will have a post-COVID time that we really have to manage behavior moving forward. When we put, when we couple our foundational truth with three universal needs of all people, we really have a framework for how we engage people, how we make people feel special, how we help get people to the next level of their lives. So three universal needs of all people, and there's more, we have 10, but we chose to focus on these three today. And that's the need for people to understand that they, have, um, that they have a sense of significance. Everyone, regardless of age and all the things we just talked about, wants to know that they have a significant role to play, whether that's at work, right? If you're an employer, an HR professional, business owner, business leader, giving those that you have influence with a sense of significance is imperative to them being productive in their workplace environment. We all want to know what the big picture is. And when you can tie that to having a sense of significance, productivity automatically skyrockets. And today, our span is what we know to be true in the workplace is also true in the home, right? Whether you're, you have a spouse, significant other, or partner, to have them understand that they have a sense of significance is empowering for many, right? When you have kids, in the home as well. Teenagers, preteen, doesn't matter when we can help them understand that they are significant, that they have a voice and a role to play in this big world. Uh, it helps them feel special. Dr. Greg Kenyatta? Yeah, I would say that, um, uh, back to my earlier point, we are learning a lot about ourselves and our family members during this time. And so uh, we can choose to be relevant or to uh, make people around us irrelevant. And so uh, to Jeff's point, the significance that you wanna have during this time, this is a critical time in American history, world history. We're going to look back and realize we've learned a lot about ourselves and our family during this particular time and understanding what your needs are and the needs you need to fulfill in other people during this time is critically important, whether it's personal or whether it's picking up the phone, texting someone and staying engaged. Absolutely. A sense of purpose, right? One of the things that we've come to know is uh, most people don't live life on purpose because they've never really discovered their true purpose, right? When we look in the workplace, something like 60% of all people are not inspired to go to work every single day, really around the issue of, of purpose. Again, if we're going to continue to have our workplaces be places of productivity and our home be places of productivity, 
we need to help people find their purpose, right? Help them understand that there's, in this big world, they have a sense of significance, they have a purpose in this life. And this third one, this third universal need is value. See, in the Dream Smart Academy, we talk about this behavioral fingerprint that we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. And that behave, behavioral fingerprint, we call it these behavioral superpowers. And when that allows everyone that we have a chance to influence or work with, whether that be GED or PhDs, right? Everyone has unique gifts, talents, and abilities, regardless of your background, where you come from, the money you have, it doesn't matter. We understand that everybody has unique gifts, talents, and abilities. And when we can connect these three universal needs and tie it to the universal truth, we see people who are willing to overcome adversity, right? Work through times of crisis like this. And not that they lack fear, but in spite of fear, they continue to move forward. So these are three universal needs for all people. The foundational truth is critical and it's the foundational piece for what we'll need as we go forward today. Dr. Greg Kenyatta, anything? Oh. I was going forward, sorry. One thing I was gonna, uh, ask, I guess, add about the purpose too, is a lot of that comes from the self-awareness. Again, you know, like mm -hmm. what you mentioned, you, when you understand these things, you have um, a clearer vision and uh, just more clarity about who you are and what you're built to do. And mm -hmm. you can avoid the square peg round hole so, situation, I call it, <laughs> which is the going to the work to a job that's not for you and, and not have been in the right place when you need to be, right? So I think that ties in. So now we can talk about family versus family. Right, well, you know, these are hybrid environments that we're working in, right? And when we can uh, tie everybody to understanding that everybody needs those three needs, when we can meet those three needs, the home place, the homework is gonna be, um, the home is gonna be uh, productive and so is your, your workplace environment. But family versus family. There was a movie back in the day, I'm a big movie buff, you know, in case you can't tell. There's a movie called Kramer versus Kramer. Does anybody remember that movie? <laughs> Dr. Greg? Type in yes if you're a pet, you know, if you're on our chat. Nobody, somebody said nope already. That means you're really young. But it was a great movie about family. Someone said yep yeah, there. Uh, so let's just open this up for to have a little bit of fun here. Is there a difference between the workplace family and your family of origin that you, you have in your home? Is there is there a difference? Dr. Greg Kenyatta, some thoughts there. Uh, go ahead, Kenyatta. Well, I think there's, you know, there there's, could be some differences, but I feel mm -hmm. like there's, you know, I mean, obviously there's, there's obvious differences when it comes to that, but I think the similarities are kind of interesting because mm -hmm. you don't get, um, you don't always have the opportunity to choose your family at home. Right. And you don't always have the opportunity to choose your family you know, at work, <laughs> you know, your coworkers, you don't get to always pick. Sometimes maybe if you're the hiring manager, you might have something to do with that. But sure. ideally, most people aren't choosing, you know, who they're working with all the time. They don't have that, the pleasure, I guess, if you would. And at home, the same thing, you know, you could have children in your house that you didn't necessarily pick, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that are there, right? Or siblings, you know, that, you know, I, I just think that the similarities are that you don't always get to choose your family at work or at home, but they're there. So what are those similarities? You know, you think about, I love how we have the, you know, the work life husband partner. People talk about, you know, you have these situations at work where if you were like me, there was a time where I would work 60, 70, 80 hours a week working for colleges. I was always there. So obviously I was spending more time with my work family <laughs> than my home family. And you hear people talk about that. Now, now everybody's home. So maybe that's, you know, mixed up a little bit, but you know, this right here, I think really says it all about, that there's more similarities, I think, than, than differences when it comes down to it, so. And I think that uh, given the time we're in now, that won't leave. We're going to continue to do things uh, via Zoom, Google, and other uh, uh, technology. We not only have our work husband, work wife, work partner, but now we have our work children. Because hmm. there are people in our work environment, the traditional work environment, where they look up to you as their mentor, their uncle, their aunt or someone that you are taking under your wing and so forth. And so that's another element of family that has now morphed. But I, I, I think that the line is, is being erased in terms of family, home versus work environment because many companies now are saying already that given the way we're working now, that over 60% of them are looking to just have their people continue to work remotely when we quote unquote get back to being able to come back and maybe they may rotate in the office one or two days a week, but 
we have to learn a whole different behavioral uh, communication dynamic moving mm -hmm. forward as we transition to the next stage of productivity and outreach in not only American society, but within our homes. Mm. Dr. Greg, you and I were talking a little earlier in the week about hybrid work environments. Is that something that you're referring to right now? Talk a little bit about this hybrid work environment that we find ourselves working in. Yeah, so, um, so I call it WHE, a work home education, where mm. we are, everything is melted together on this type of device, this device or a laptop. I tell people all the time, all I need is this, to be within two hours of an airport and to have access to Wi-Fi and my, and my laptop. That's all I need. I don't need to be anywhere physically anymore. Most people are in that same boat, depending on the type of environment that you have. But when we look at a hybrid work environment, it's also not a hybrid work environment. It's a hybrid family environment, uh, environment a hybrid communication environment, engagement environment. Now. I don't need to go shop anymore. I can call Insta, Instacart. I can uh, do this and do that. I have Uber Eats. So everything is now creating a, a, a symbiotic relationship now where we have to purposely leave our house to be active. Now think mm -hmm. about that. And now we know that given what's happening now, one of my biggest concerns about society around the world is being institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Because we've been inside so long, there are some people that said, you know what? I don't need to go outside. I'll just take my vitamin D. I don't need to get any sun. We have to be very careful of that as we transition to this new whatever it's going to be. And I don't think it's called the new normal anyway, uh, anymore. I think that we're moving to a whole different um, uh, paradigm in world uh, history in terms of the things that we're looking at. As I look at the research and as I look, as I look at the unfortunate things we'll talk about in a moment regarding the stressors, we're seeing some trends take place now. Sadly, we won't know the impact on this time in history for about five to 10 years or more. Right. Well, here's something that I do believe. What we do today with family will impact the, fi the families of the future. Absolutely. Right. So it's critical that we start to understand this paradigm. We start to understand and align behavioral differences and communication differences. We call it those things superpowers. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of the slide is, yes, there are differences in the workplace family and your, you know, your, your family of origin, but they can be managed with some of the same tools and resources. You, you both agree? Yes. I've Absolutely. Because even in both of these worlds, you know, because we're again, we're talking about communication behaviors and, and, you know, trying to create a um, some sort of harmony, <laughs> whether it be at work or at home. And so, you know, at home, even though your family's there and you don't always get to choose them, just because they're your family doesn't mean you get along with them doesn't mean you have easy ways to communicate with them. You might not even like them. Right. <laughs> they're still in your house and they're part of your family. Well, at work, isn't it the same thing? You know? yes. So you yeah, don't necessarily... The what? They're in your house and they can't leave. Right, and they can't leave. So now what do you do? You know what I mean? So, and, and at work, you know, maybe you have some flexibility, maybe. But again, you know, you're working with people who are different than you that you may not necessarily get along with. And they're, they're so close to you that we can kind of call them family. And I think this is what this is, you know, really about is their family. If you're spending a lot of time with them, they're some form of family, not just necessarily biological family. Mm -hmm. So it's a broad term. And, and I think it covers everything we're talking about here. So we, before we move on really quickly, Kenyatta, let's think about our work environments and our home environments today. Is there sibling rivalry in our home environment with our, our kids, right? Oh, yeah. I, I have kids. I'm remarried, so I have six kids. So this is a little bit of sibling rivalry going on, right? And in, in the workplace, we don't call it sibling rivalry, but it's the same concept of the colleague rivalry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Direct reports. That seems like really formal... Uh, language to introduce into a person's home. But think about, you know, if you're the CEO or vice president, whatever position of influence you have, you have people that report directly to you and they're responsible for managing, you know, their area of responsibility. Well, isn't that the same in our home as well? We have direct reports out, those who report to us directly, right, are responsible for managing and establishing peace in the home and reducing the friction in the home. Right. And I, the, the, my direct reports are my kids. They report directly to me and my wife, right? Or, you know, wife and, you know, spouse, partner, all those things. So. And, and let me add something that was so interesting because when you think about in terms of direct reports, right, ideally, if, if you have direct reports, whether you're in the workplace or home like kids, you expect those direct reports to um, obey, 
<laughs> right? You expect them to kind of do what you say because you're the boss, right? Like they, you give them tasks, they need to carry it out and you, you know, try to um, regulate if they're not and have conversations and isn't the same thing happening at home. And here's the thing, those direct reports, even though they know they should be behaving and obeying, don't always and don't always think that you're the one they should be listening to anyway. <laughs> and so that happens at home and at work, and right? Work. So, so they're insubordinate, you know, and again, how do you handle that, whether it be a child or be someone you hire to work for you? Yeah, okay, I'm my wife's direct report. So <laughs> I, I get sent the time out and I get sequestered all the time. So it's <laughs> Right, right. At the end of the day, this last piece here says, it's about bottom line productivity. Whether we're working in a hiring environment, in a virtual situation, remotely, in person, we have to have tools and resources that allow us to be productive. Next slide, Kenyatta. <laughs> Productivity at working at home has never been more important, right? Because we do find ourselves in this new working environment where, you know, I have a Zoom call. I may have three Zoom calls. My kids have a Zoom call at 10. My fifth grader has a Zoom call at nine. And, you know, the sixth grader has a, a Zoom call at, at 10 and then you know, my college students home and they, they got things going on. So we're tr we, we need to introduce tools that allow us to navigate, you know, the friction in the home, right? That a lot of homes that Dr. Grant's gonna talk about in a moment are experiencing, you know, we allow, you know, to introduce tools that are gonna also in increase the engagement in our home. So productivity at work and at home and behavior matters and, and all of this, if you're an HR professional, um, if you're a business owner, uh, you understand the slide right here about still needing to impact the bottom line, which is what we talk about with 23%, um, bottom line profitability, employee productivity being 40%, and team productivity. Take that out of the business arena, and you move that into the, to the family environment, it's the same concept. And what we're talking about here is a behavioral solution, right, that introduces behavioral uh, insights, uh, communications insights, financial insights, and we call those things superpowers. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. But here's what we need when we're talking about being pro product, you know, um, productivity at home and at work. You need inspiration, right? We talk about the the lack of inspiration that employees come to work every day. They lack inspiration. So if we're going to especially be productive, you know, productive in this new environment, we got to find ways to inspire those that we work with both at home, in our home place environment, and with our work situation as well. We gotta find ways to engage, right? Provide these behavioral insights, which is what we're gonna do. Kenyatta, when we get to your piece, mm -hmm. right? Talk about how we smooth communication so people can engage uh, effectively and not get so frustrated at because one's not being valued or one's not given a sense of significance. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about finances but this slide says it all, whether you're dealing with uh, your, your new hiring environment, in person, remotely, the key is we have to be productive both at home and at work. Anything to add to this, Dr. Greg and Kenyatta? No, I think it speaks for itself. Yep, all right. Poll. Here's our first poll question. Kenyatta, you wanna handle the poll question? Yes, yeah, so um, you guys know how to chat, you know, in the little chat box. And we're curious about what new stressors that you might be dealing with in the world of COVID-19. Now, you may have had some of these stressors prior. I call it BC, before COVID. But there might be some very specific things you're dealing with now that you feel like were brought on in this particular world. So if you could, please, in the chat, just tell us. You can... Um, respond to uh, all attendees if you want everyone to know or if you want it to be a secret then just do the panelists and we'll only be able to see but just drop some words in there that you feel like describe what you've been going through what are some stressors um, as we move forward we'd love to hear from you and we'll speak to some of those as well so dr greg this is where we would really like to hear some of the research that you um, have done and some of the the um, talks that you've had with school principals and, and the like around the, around the country. This next slide here, I'm going to shut up and be quiet. Let's talk about uh, dealing with some of these stressors uh, for COVID-19 and beyond. So um, I have a, a series of articles being published um, and the title is it's called Surviving World War C. And I look at COVID-19 as, as a war. 
And so that's why I dubbed it World War C. Uh, when we look at war, when we looked at global conflict, there are certain elements that come into play when we try to defeat the enemy. And the enemy is going to be less and less this virus and more and more us. Mm -hmm. How we respond to the impact of the bomb that was dropped and how we respond to our recovery. So we're in a very interesting time right now in American history. You know, 9-11 um, changed the way that we travel. It changed the way that uh, a lot of things uh, took place uh, uh, right, uh, post 9-11 and, and forever. There's a generation of children and people that don't even remember what it was like parking at the curb of an airport, walking in uh, and walking all the way to the gate, no security. And then we started to have security. 9-11 uh, has created that whole different dynamic shift. We're seeing now remnants of what this new world is going to look like. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, we have additional stresses that we're faced with on a consistent basis. And we are now in the stage of what I call COVID fatigue. People mm -hmm. have been sequestered at home so long. And I, and I said this uh, in, a, in another interview uh, about two months ago, I said, there's gonna be a point well, you're not gonna keep Americans or any people behind their doors for too much longer. People would rather take the chance on becoming ill than not being able to ex exercise their freedoms or being able to go outside or be able to walk and have a, a, a fresher breath air, uh, to be able to engage with other people. In fact, I don't even like the term social distancing. And let me tell you why, because to me, it's morphing into what I call social disassociation. People don't even smile at each other, even above the mask. People are not engaging with each other on the positive because they look at everyone as a COVID carrier. Because of this, people's anxiety levels are raising. People are fe feeling rushed to get in and out of their house. And the grief that people are feeling, because I've had two friends pass away in the last six uh, weeks over COVID and unable to attend their funerals. So there's grief and guilt that, that setting in with families right now. And so these are elements that if we're not very careful as a society, we will become COVID sick in weeks and months and years to come because of this. When you cannot even bury your own mom or dad or be at the, uh, the, the side of someone that's getting married, these are life moments that we all treasure, but we've all taken them for granted until now. So because of all these different things that are making us fearful, we're seeing cortisol stress levels rise in, in folks across America. Sadly, uh, based upon the data uh, and the research I've done and, and the work that I do, I think that we're going to see an epidemic of not of COVID in the near future. We're gonna see an epidemic of spousal abuse, child abuse, elder abuse. We're gonna see an epidemic of, of, um, of, of people uh, turning to alternative forms of relief, drugs and other types of things that are going to impact their family environment. But we're also seeing another effect take place. And that is what I call Zoom and Google fatigue. <laughs> <I'm> yesterday, <there. laughs> yesterday I had 11 Zoom there. webinars mm -hmm. and it is overwhelming now. And because mm -hmm. of that stressor, I had to have my, my friend, Jeff Morris, he is now my accountability partner, mm. to check in with each other and saying, hey, are you shutting it down? And so I wanna recommend to everyone that we have to be very careful because we can go so far from this bookend to this bookend that our stresses will increase uh, higher than they were before COVID. Mm -hmm. When we look at the divorce rate, because, uh, um, because uh, uh, the court systems are shut down right now. Already I'm hearing from friends that are in the legal profession that they've already got inquiries for divorces and separation that are skyrocketing. Now think about this. And when I said it earlier, it was tongue in cheek, but I really meant it. We were not designed to live under the roof 24 seven with our same DNA. We need variety as a people, as a species. And because we're so locked up together, we have to be very careful of getting into a rut because it can lead to what I call trauma drama. And when that happens, you can be abusive. Now, let me talk about abuse, what that looks like. You can, you can be abusive by your non-interaction with family members because you're upset, you're mad. You can be abusive by what you say, what you don't say, 
You can be abusive by raising a hand to your wife, your spouse, your partner, your family, when you would not have otherwise if you had the relief of going somewhere for eight to 10 hours a day to the quote unquote job, then coming home and then just coming together and, and just venting together. That's not there now for us. So we have to be very careful and we have to be very intentional about how we're going to move forward so that everything we do does not allow us to remove our identity from our family. So I have to remind myself all the time that I'm a husband, I'm a grandfather, I'm a dad, uh, I'm an uncle, I'm, I'm a, a nephew. I have to do those things so that I keep my ecosystem in balance. Without an intentional ecosystem, this is the most dangerous time of this pandemic. Yes, the pandemic is real and people are getting sick and they're dying and it's very, very sad. But years and decades from now, we're going to see the impact of this if we're not very careful. So I just want to uh, advise everyone to make sure that you're decoupling from technology. Make okay. sure that- Dr. Gray, Dr. Gray and yeah. we're gonna to get to that in a minute, what oh. Dr. Gray oh. says before we wrap up. <laughs> yeah. okay. and, so, and we've got a couple of comments in here too. Absolutely. You know, uh, some of the, the, you know, the people responding about being worried about the health of their families and friends and uh, employees working remotely or being furloughed, not wanting to return to work because of fear of the unknown. They're concerned about that. Uh, someone talks about um, not getting swept into the panic of the population of food supplies, cleaning supplies, paper products, you know, obviously, um, uh, response, uh, our response is always key to challenges that is the only thing we can control. A uh, better term is physical distance. Um, we do not have to distance socially, so it goes along with that. Someone says there's been a huge increase in the domestic abuse uh, where they live in Houston. So a lot of a um, lot of information here. So thank you guys for, for sharing that as we move forward. And as we move forward too, we'll be talking about uh, what, what, what Dr. Gregg describes as um, and I describe as the punch in the mouth. I always use the quote from Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And the, the world has been punched in the mouth right now. So all of these things that are happening, especially on this list, it amplifies your natural hardwired instinctual behavior. Absolutely. And that could be a power or a kryptonite. Yeah. And I think that's what we're gonna start talking about next is all these things are happening now. So how are you responding to it? And he's great, made some great points about some things to be aware of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And someone did say our response is always key to the challenges, for that is the only thing in which we have control. A better term is physical distance. We don't have to be so distant socially. So whoever said that, you know, kudos to you, because we talk about just managing what you can control on a daily basis. And that's all you can do um, is to respond um, responsibly. I call it responsibility. Right, what's my ability to respond to the situation at hand? Poll question number two. And I know everybody here um, is a seasoned professional at some point, you probably had some type of personality test. So I'll poll question number two, have you ever completed a personality test? Whether it be Myers-Briggs, DISC, Strengths Finders, um, Berkman, we know them all. So type in one of these responses here and we'll keep the, uh, the conversation moving. Kenyatta, okay. won't you share a little bit about this um, this graphic that we have here? One of the quotes that I know you love. This is a great graphic, oh, I love it, by the way. Yes, and I, I love this uh, the quote by Veronica Tuga, Tugaleva. And um, actually, I think her first name is, I think there's supposed to be an E there. But um, to know thyself, you must sacrifice the illusion that you already do. And mm -hmm. I really think that is so key because oftentimes, especially as we are grow up, you know, we say, hey, you know, we, we think we know ourselves. We think we understand how we roll, why we do what we do. Um, and a lot of times, I really think that's just ego, sometimes sitting on the shoulder trying to tell you what's going on, right? And you have to kind of look within. And that's a process, though, because you might have outside people who are telling you this is how they perceive you. And so you have that idea. You have how you perceive yourself. Um, but sometimes, and I know for me, at my ripe old age, I'm still getting reintroduced to myself all the time. There'll be mm -hmm. one day I'll wake up and I'll be like, oh, I didn't like that thing anymore. I don't like that thing anymore. Or I do like this now. I'm always fascinated at the things I learn about myself. And so that's why I love this quote so much. So to know yourself, you must sacrifice the illusion that you already do because as soon as you think you've got it all figured out, and you know everything you're about yourself, it's probably when you're in trouble mm -hmm. because your mind is now in a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. So mm -hmm. from that, you know, so many things can come when you open up your mind and go, wait a minute, I could probably learn some new things about myself that could 
help me uh, deal with some of these things that are happening or the self-realization that once you look your behavior in the face, now you can make conscious decisions about how you want to live your life and be congruent with what you really believe and know to be true. Right, Kenyatta, that's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. A couple of responses from our panelists, I mean, our, our poll, no, not yet, um, DISC, um, so what Thomas said, many, uh, Enneagram, number four, uh, Myers and Briggs, uh, we, we're familiar with all of those. And those are all great tools because they give us a sense of a measurement so that we can quantify and qualify who we are going forward. So, and I see Ramona Jones. Thank you so much for sharing, Ramona. Hope you're well. Glad you're on the, on the uh, webinar today. Let's talk a little bit about our, our behavioral fingerprint. Kenyatta, you do this so well. I'll, I'm going to leave this slide to you. Do, okay. Talk a little bit about this slide. Sure. So real quickly, and we're going to dig into what um, some of these fingerprints might look like, but we know that uh, probably about the age of three is when who you are starts getting ingrained into your amygdala. And these experiences that you have from that point forward really dictate your behavior and what we call your behavioral superpowers. And there's 10 of them, and we'll share with them in just a moment. But as you grow, there are certain things that happen beneath the surface of who you are. 95% of you is that natural hardwired behavior, if you will, that dictate how you make decisions and deal with families, whether or not you are someone who's risky or not, or concrete, focused on relationships or focused on results, abstract, flexible, all these things are already kind of uh, there for you. But the fingerprints is what makes you so unique as well, because that's 5% of you. That's above the ice, above the, the water of the line of an iceberg, if you will, because your life experience is expert expectations, environments, passions, values, all those things come together to make you who you are. It makes you extremely unique. So while there's 10 behavioral superpowers, if I've got mm -hmm. 10 fingers on my hands and my hands kind of look like everybody else's hands for the most part, if we, if we got 10 fingers, Jeff, hold up your hands. Dr. Mm -hmm. Greg, hold up your hands, right? All of our hands basically look the same, right? But what's unique is our fingerprints. And those two, no two are alike. And that's because my life experiences are different than Dr. Greg's. I went to different schools than, than Jeff did, right? All those things are different, but there's lots of similarities though that happen, which is why we can put us into these 10 behavioral superpowers, but then uniquely, we've got other things that are going on down there because we've just lived different lives. Then they shape us at a very young age, they start shaping us and they shape our behavior. Mm -hmm. So Kenyatta, as we move on, we talked about 87% of poor business performance and poor performance in life being around the issue of behavior. Mm -hmm. So when we're not addressing behavioral issues, both at home and in the workplace, um, we see friction, right? We see unfortunate things, we see violence, we see a number of things when there's not this alignment of behavior and especially in our communication. I know we're gonna get into that in just a little bit, you take this slide as well, these 10 behavior sure. superpowers. One of the things I'm going to ask people to do as you're talking through this, take a look through these 10 behavior superpowers. Let's have some fun again with this slide. If you uh, can relate to one of these or you think you're one of these, type it into um, the chat box and I'll be uh, listening to Kenyatta and as she talks uh, about these, these superpowers. Uh, absolutely. So very quickly. So the first one is an adapter. We call them like the chameleon. <laughs> because they literally can flex from any of these superpowers <laughs> very, very easily. They're extremely adaptable. Um, again, the name adapter. So uh, for them, sometimes they might be on the fence and have to be kicked to one side or the other, um, mm -hmm. but they have a power there because they can just fit into whatever the situation uh, might need to be necessary. Community builders are exactly that. Their people want to bring everyone together. They also want a consensus from everyone when they're making decisions. They want everyone to get along. They want everyone to be happy and ultimately they are a lot, a lot of fun. They like to bring people together and typically they're connectors. Uh, engagers talk a lot. <laughs> they're engaging all the time and they are connectors as well. They like a wide circle of people around them so that they can engage. They like to bring people together. They're usually very excited, very flexible, um, outgoing in personalities, if you will. Facilitators have an uncanny way to bring people together and get things done while caring about the people as this, at the same time. They're able to make those things happen in a very synergistic way and they facilitate what's happening. Um, then we've got the influencer, uh, that's me annoying and obnoxious <laughs> that's pretty much but and uh and yeah greg you say right 
he's like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Not all the time. <laughs> Not all the time, right? So influencers, we're visionaries. We, we see the big picture. We can bring people together. Usually uh, we enjoy being in the front of the room. We don't have a problem doing that. Uh, influencing people to, to, to galvanize together to help people generally. If we, if we have something that we're really passionate about, we will try to get everyone on board with that. Um, and we can use our speaking skills and our presentation skills, outgoing personalities really to make that happen. Initiators, that's Dr. Greg. He's like the hatchet. He's going to get it done. No matter what it is, he's going to get it done. And if you don't want something done, don't even whisper it to him because he'll probably go and do it. And you're like, no, 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 that was just an idea. And he's like, that's already done. You know? <laughs> so you want to make sure um, they're like the spark that like ignites something, but then he moves on. So he'll spark it and then he's on to something else. He doesn't want to mm -hmm. deal with everything else. He'll set it up and then he's out. He wants to set the agenda and get moving. Uh, reflective thinkers, that is Jeff. He's the one who will do exactly that. He will reflectively think. Mm -hmm. And we know we have to give him his time to do so. <laughs> <laughs> so because of that, when he comes, when he comes back with after he's done his thing, it'll be perfection. Because reflective thinkers appreciate quality. They are facts-based. They want the information. They will make the decision when they feel like they've got everything to make that decision. Everyone else around them is just going to have to wait. And then relationship builders. They are, again, I mean, that's a simple one, relationship. They love, love people. They love making sure that everyone has what they need. They are supporters. Typically in roles where they can support people is where they're the happiest versus someone like an initiator. He wants to get it done and make the rules. Someone like a relationship builder is a perfect person to have on the team because they'll execute whatever it was that the initiator needed a strategist exactly that they doesn't matter what it is they'll come up with a plan and they'll have it all laid out in spreadsheets and everything they will thought 15 years into the future about exactly how that's going to work um and they could be great to work with if you can keep up with them <laughs> but if not then that might be a challenge because they've already got a plan so and then the stylish thinker which is interesting they have a um, a mix of uh being outgoing and loving working with people, but they're extremely technical at the same at the same time. They're almost kind of like a, you know, a little bit of all of these mixed together in some sort of way. So they're extremely unique in the way that they handle uh, processes and make decisions. And uh, hence, they are the stylish thinker. So that's just a quick rundown of them. If you feel like you're one of those, I think the next poll says, which one do you think you are? That's the next poll. So can you as we transition to this slide here, Let's take what you just talked about and let's put it in to the context of our conversation, behavior is a family affair. Sure. So on our team, on our Dream Smart team, we have uh, you the influencer, right? Me the reflective thinker, Dr. Greg and, and three or four others, Terry Hawkins and Ted McLyman, uh, they're all initiators. And what's great about um, our workplace uh, relationship is we all understand this and we respect it about each other. Right, you know you have to give me time in order for me to get something of value that I think is of value to you, who's gonna influence it and sell it. Dr. Greg, once he gets the, the, the thing that he needs to do, he's gonna initiate it, right? We have Dr. Barbara Duncan, who's our, our adapter. We may make a pivot, 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 pivot. She just so, so smooth with it. Jen Mitchell, who is our stylish thinker. So having this type of information at the core of who a person is, really helps us to create productive work environments. Let's switch it to our home environment. This is a tool that we also use to coach, train, and mentor our kids too, right? I have, I shouldn't say kids, I have three young adults, college age, and I know that one's a facilitator, right? I know that one's a strategist. My youngest is a strategist, right? We know that we have influencers, and when we can have this information, Dr. Greg, now we can have meaningful conversations about who, each one of those, uh, about who each one are, and that provides a sense of those three needs, significance, purpose, and value. We could tie it back to the emotional need and the behavioral need. So I won't spend too much more time on that, but just um, as an HR professional, as a business owner, as a, as a parent, spouse, this information is um, critical as we start to look at how we can provide tools and resources, both now and in the future, for helping our families, both work family and home family. Absolutely. And so um, the next slide, I think, is we have a, we're going to give you an example of a family who knows this information. Um, it was a 12-year-old who is a facilitator. So if you look at this little chart over here, you see we've got facilitators. Um, her mother is a facilitator. She's also in the video. And the dad is a stylish thinker. 
and you'll be able to see some of the, the clear differences between them and how powerful it is for someone as young as 12 to understand what her behavioral superpower is and how she relates to that. And this slide over here, or this left side over here is about communication because again, it's always gonna come down to that. And all of these particular behavioral superpowers um, communicate in a certain way. Um, research shows that you know, those of us who are influencers, engagers, typically want more lifestyle in our communication, open, verbal, you know, lots of graphics. Uh, we're also goal setters. We're right in the middle between that. We want to speak in that way. Jeff's down there, reflective thinker. He's information facts and everything like that. And then we've got some of the profiles over here who want stability in how they communicate. So all of these tie together. And when you have access to this information, you'll be able to see exactly where you might fall. So this video is about three minutes long I'm gonna pop it on right now and I, just to give you guys who are watching not just from our perspective but from the perspective of people who just recently um, learned this information um, a few months ago actually so let's see if it'll play here and then we'll watch and from a family dynamic right you guys have learned some things about each other so talk real briefly we'll wrap up with that how does how does it work with the family now that Danielle and McKenna, you know your facilitators and you're very abstract facilitators. You're very creative and very flexible. And then yeah. you've got Bobby, stylist thinker in the middle of it all. <laughs> the concrete stylist thinker, <laughs> right? So how has that been working? How have you guys been working with this um, about your superpowers? Well, as I kind of stated in the last video, um, mom and I are stylish thinker. No, sorry, was facilitators. He's a stylish thinker. And so he's very concrete. And so when we're going with the flow and we're just kind of like a team or like, dad, why can't you just like, you know, just go with it, you know, don't be the one who has to, you know, kind of cause the issue being like, we have to do this, 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 and this. It's not that it's that it's, it's, it's who I am. Yeah. It's who he, sorry. Yeah. It's who, it's who he is. And we have to realize that we need to work not as so much a team, but as a duo, we need to work together, you know, and, Trio. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Trio. Trio. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny to look at it that I'm concrete and systematic and that they're abstract and flexible. Yeah. So it, it we're totally opposites, like mm -hmm. not even close to each other. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, high percentage in the other two and they're high percentage. And yes. We're very far apart. We're not yeah. even close to being, uh, you know, we're kind of the same. Nope. It, Two, well, it's two and one different person. <laughs> so it makes it even harder in my, in my role because I have, I have two of them that I have to facilitate to. <laughs> so it, but the thing is, is we, we've all learned to um, learn our traits and uh, just go with it. You know? yeah, just, and plan accordingly. So we, I have to kind of get out of the city every once in a while. That's my thing. And I just want to go. I don't want to have a plan. I want to get away from the plan. Yeah, I need same. to just get out of here. <laughs> yep, same. And he needs has a horrible time with he that. He needs a plan. It is like, what are you trying to do to me? <laughs> so he's learning how to schedule the spontaneity. <laughs> yeah. so well, just because I know that they like to get away um, from the city life. So I make a plan <laughs> for myself. That we're, I'm taking them and we're going to go somewhere. And they don't say, well, where are we going? I just say, we're going somewhere. And they're like, okay, we're getting out of the city. Perfect. We're happy. <laughs> so we kind of work that way. So they let me do what I do. And I let them do what they do. Mm. And we've worked as a family to kind of, you know, do do these things. You know, we, we learn to use strengths and weaknesses to our advantage. And as a family, you know, we learn that, you know, with these awesome little um, business DNA sheets, um, you know, what we don't work well and what we do and how we should not, but, you know, bump heads. We should not butt heads with this. We need to work with each other as a family, you know. Um, we got to kind of work together. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Greg, before Kenyatta moves on and she has a little bit of her insight, how powerful is this um, information to have um, as we look at, you know, our new working environments. Um, if you're on the panel, if you would like to share a thought um, from what you just witnessed, this is a 12 year old girl who now has an understanding of who she is at her behavioral level. And she can now express that and her parents have 
uh, specific insights on how um, to relate to her and communicate to her. This is powerful uh, information, whether you're dealing with work, place, family, or uh, home families. Dr. G, your thoughts? Well, uh, I would say, you know, and from a family, to your point in terms of power and impact, uh, think about all of us as, as family members knowing this, not only about ourselves, but quite frankly, most importantly, most critically about our children, those that we are guardians over and that we support. My children are grown adults, 31, 30, and 27. And, and I look back at their life and I wonder how I could have better coached them, disciplined them, loved them, encouraged them, guided them, and listen to them if I knew how they were behaviorally wired as early as possible. I went back and I, I looked at a video, uh, videos of my kids when they were two, three, four, five years of age. My kids are the exact same way now as adults as they were when they were children. That's when it hit me. Wow, what was I missing during all of that time before I knew any of this through the Dream Smart Academy? And so it would really help increase our our behavioral uh, impact in the home environment, which carries over into the workplace as well. So now we all walk around our home uh, empowered. My three children are initiators like me. My wife's a stylish thinker. Now I understand why she, I mean, why I get into conversations and arguments with her at times because she likes to do things a very certain way that drives me nuts. And I just say, let's just get it done. And so, and so because we know that, it has reduced the, in, the conflicts that we have because I said, oh, I'm hearing from a stylish thinker. That's how I look at it now. And she says, oh, I'm hearing from a hard hit. I mean, an initiator. And so that's how I need to look at it. So it's very helpful in a family and work environment. Kenyatta. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, that's all I got to add because you'll hear from me a little bit later. For the sake of time, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll let you guys go. <laughs> so so for, my, for my poll question, uh, we have a strategist, initiator, engager. Someone thinks that all of those, and the unique thing is you could be uh, some of those, uh, but some of those are, I'll show up a little stronger in uh, what we call our one page factor report where we're looking at like 200 behaviors. You could have a little bit of all of those behaviors, but one will be one or two will be more dominant. Stylish thinkers, someone say great insight to determine if this new understanding can bring increased sensitivity, displacement, frustration, and arguments. We know that it does. It's not a might or a maybe, right? This information that we've uh, gleaned over over 10 years of our own experience, but working with or organizations that have used these insights for more than 30 years, we know that we can reduce friction at home or, or in the workplace. We know that we can bring a common language for behavior where people can just be more empathetic and more productive. Kenyatta, please yeah. share here as we're almost ready to, to wrap up in just a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got a couple minutes here. This right here, the report that she held up, this is an example of one. This is mine. I was being full transparency. Okay, this is who I am. <laughs> so this is one of the reports. There's 40 different uh, things that come from one 15 minute discovery exercise. And so you get a report that looks talks about your you know, your superpower. And these are some of the fingerprints we talk about my particular radio buttons, I'm outgoing, I'm fast paced. And it tells how people need to relate to me and then the communication uh, superpower, which says that I am someone who lifestyle first, then goal setting. That's how I'm going to communicate. That's what I want to know. And then you can see the information here is kind of low. I always tell Jeff, I need three bullet points. That's it. And I'm out. <laughs> you know, that's why there's my there's my score right there that shows that. So just an example of kind of the information that can come from this. And this is what McKenna was actually reading her report. And she believed it. So Kenyatta, let's, before you move on, let's talk oh. about results versus relationships. We go back really quickly. Yes. We look at again, taking this out of the context of this conversation and putting it into an HR professional, mm. business owner, family. How important is it for us to know whose res results focus versus whose relationship focus? huge it's it's huge if you've got numbers that are above like a 50 there uh 50 65 and up is high so you're so me i'm very very focused on relationships as you can see at a 93 that's off the charts i think dr greg you're a 99 okay on results that means that we're going to get the job done we're going to make sure that what happens needs to happen now because of that we may may sacrifice 
a relationship or two along the Not way. Not may, you will. <laughs> I, hey, I'm learning. I, you know, meditate. You know what right. I mean? So I don't want to be patient. But if someone's the flip of that, like that's a power for me. That's right. a power for Dr. Greg. That's a power for you, Jeff, to be such in such high scores and results. But however, our kryptonite might be the fact of a relationship that may need to be fostered that isn't be. Now, as a flip of that, if someone with a high re relationship, they may not get the job done for fear of damaging a relationship. Now, that's a kryptonite for them. So the, the beautiful place is to be in the middle. If we were in the middle, no one would ever fight, right? But there's too much variances here with how people deal with that. So if you look at your employee and you see that they're focused on relationships and you're wondering why they're not getting their job done, you look at that and they have a 93 in relationships. Well, that's why they're not getting the job done. <laughs> they're over there making friends, you know? So, but sometimes without the access to this information, we can only guess why they're not getting the job done. Absolutely. And sometimes we take things personal because we don't really know. But if you look at my report and you know this about me, you know how I'm going to show up. And therefore, don't take it personal if, you know, things aren't going how you think they should. <laughs> right. So lots of great information here. We can't spend a whole bunch of time. But are you daring versus careful? Oh, sorry. <laughs> are you abstract versus concrete? You know, are you systematic versus flexible? Are you promoting versus operating? This is all very critical information to have um, for either our kids or for those that, you know, we employ or for our own stuff as a business owner. And this right here just basically shows another thing that can happen with this info. You can take two people and run a comparison report and you can see the dynamics between being someone who's take charge versus cooperative, outgoing versus reserved. You can see where these numbers would show and you can clearly see why there might be friction like he talked about. And once you understand these differences, it's much easier to manage. It's not speculation. It's not someone being taken it personal. It's just how we are naturally wired, our behavioral superpowers. Now you can, with that information, make conscious decisions about how you're going to choose to communicate with each other when you're clear on that. Kenyatta, and this is my profile and your profile, correct? When we compare the two. Um, it, actually, it isn't technically, but it kind of looks like it could be. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> got it. Yep, yep. We got a couple of minutes here, so we got to get going. Can you to handle this slide too? Sure. So it just it talks a little bit about the dimensions. If you're a leader on this call, you know, you own a company, you're HR related. We just have um, dimensions within our behavioral superpower universe that we can help with this information because everyone's affected. So whether it's leadership development, team performance, workplace operations, culture, behavioral styles in the classroom, I've used this in my classrooms where all the students knew their behavioral superpowers and they knew mine day one the barriers to communication just melted because everyone knew who they were and they didn't apologize for who they were and they honored because the one thing we know is that everyone wants to fit in, but everybody wants to be different. And this actually gave everyone a chance to do that day one in a classroom. It changed the game. I've never seen anything like it. And so obviously using this information in any of these applications is what we can, what we use it for and what you might want to use it for as well. And I think we already kind of talked a little bit about yeah, some of this. We okay. did. All so right. we, we can probably go past the communications because I think we've talked about the importance of communication. Yep, we talked and about that. Let's get down to um, the last couple of slides there. Yep, this is Dr. Um, Dr. Greg. Dr. Greg, we'll let, leave the last word with you to wrap up in a couple of minutes here. Um, Sheila and Paige, thank you for being patient as we wrap up here. Dr. Greg says, you got the last word, my brother. All right, so uh, first of all, I wanna thank everyone for being on the call like this because it's all about how do we help each other be our best selves, uh, behaviorally, um, how we engage with family, communication and so forth. Uh, one of the things that we really wanna to wrap up with is what can we do to be better? Well, first of all, we have to make sure we stay connected in, uh, in a disconnected world. And I didn't say an unconnected, I said disconnected world. As I said before, I don't like the word social distancing. I prefer the word physical distancing so that we can still have social engagement with people. And that is a big concern that I have. So what I've done is this, is I've made it uh, purposeful for me to text or call or email three five to five new people every day, my family, colleagues, just to reach out, hey, how you doing and so forth. That will help me stay balanced and help them as well just by hearing from someone. And we have to be very careful of how we communicate with folks because we can get such in the mindset of just the day-to-day the -day functions that we don't engage with people. So once again, stay connected is critically important. And we want to make sure that we stay connected in a world that's, that's not allowing us to in many cases right now. 
We have to do not stress management, stress engagement. Stress is stress. It's going to be there whether we like it or not. So we have to be able to manage that. Disconnect with Zoom and Google. Set a timer. Whatever you need to do to disengage from your desk and get away so that you can engage with family or just re-engage with yourself. Make sure, please, that we're all laughing every day, watching comedy or whatever it may be. Make sure we're exercising all the things we know to do, but the things we don't do. And one of the patterns that's really being impacted during this COVID time is our sleep patterns. And we don't allow our bodies to heal themselves if we don't do that. And then, of course, we want to make sure that we're not becoming what I call institutionalized, because that is a very high danger point right now, people being used to being inside and disconnecting with people right now. And last point I'll just make is we have to know that we are in a, in a world of having to pivot now and a new way we have to communicate, engage, but do not let the pandemic turn into your internal family and workplace pandemic because we are on a journey now that I'm very excited about as we get through this, just like we did post 9-11. And yes, it's horrific what's happened to the world, but we have an opportunity now to do things differently by engaging our behavior and the way we impact with people in a very different way. Thank you, Dr. Greg. That's awesome ways and strategies, actionable strategies that we can use today um, for how we manage um, our new normal. Kenyatta, you can wrap us up with the contact us slide as well. Absolutely. So you can see our contact information over there, but we are um, offering free gifts to those who are on the call today. Um, if you are interested and you do have a team that you'd be interested in having access to the behavioral superpowers that we spoke about, we actually have a free 60 day trial of our team development package. So you can email us and get more information about that. And we also are going to give you access to the behavioral superpowers discovery exercise yourself. It's 15 minutes. You can also contact us if you want to be able to take that because you were on the call and that is our gift to you. And then we're going to give away 10 of you are going to get an opportunity to get um, what we call an uncovering coaching session with us so you'll take the discovery exercise but have a conversation with me or Jeff where we will go over your results and help you have an understanding of what that information means because we want everyone to know their behavioral superpower so we appreciate you being here and thanks for listening everybody thank you so much for being on the webinar with us today and just to iterate the, reiterate the last point is behavior matters at all times and everywhere and um, we're certainly excited to be of uh, service to you any way that we can. Uh, turnkey, team, uh, turnkey team, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, once again be a part of this virtual summit. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.